Hello and welcome to this episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm Father Nathan Castle, your host, and I thought I would uh, introduce the original Joyful Friar. This is St. Dominic Guzman. He's the founder of the Dominicans, the Order of Preachers, of which I've been a member for 42 years. This little uh, oil portrait of him was painted by my grandmother, probably back in the late 1930s because uh, both of her daughters became members of the order. Here's one of them late in life with my dad. Um, but, And this is one of my dad back in the 30s when his younger sister, Leona, uh, joined our order. But anyway, Dominic was known as the Joyful Friar, so I'm borrowing his nickname. Uh, and so I'm kind of a wannabe Joyful Friar. In fact, I am joyful a lot of the time. But I also... Uh, I think it's important to live in joyful hope that even if we're going through a rough patch, that um, joy isn't the first emotion that springs up inside of us. I believe that hope can get us there. So the joyful friar. Uh, today, one, well, actually, one of the reasons I created this podcast at all is because I wanted to have another forum in which to share stories that have been a part of my life for a number of years that are recorded in my two books, Afterlife Interrupted, books one and two. If you're new to uh, to what I do and this podcast and so on, and if you like what you hear today, I'd encourage you to to read book one because it ex it's an odd topic. Uh, I believe it's holy work. I'm thoroughly convinced it is, and I it's ex it's explained in detail in the first of the two books in this series. This story that I'm going to tell today is in the second of the two books. Each book has 13 stories that are stories of people who died sudden, violent deaths, who came to me in a dream and showed me a circumstance that um, broke their heart or ended their life here abruptly. I write the story down in a journal that I keep on my nightstand because these come at the rate of about one a week. I then... Get make an appointment with one of my prayer partners, and we we then deal with the person's story. We go into protected prayer with the angels and the saints, uh, and then I can allow my voice to be borrowed. I believe my voice is consecrated uh, by God's design. Uh, I entered the order of preachers, and preaching and and vocal uh, expression of the good news is very important to us. So anyway, my, I believe my voice is a tool that the Lord can uh, can lend to someone else who needs a voice to tell their story. Anyway, many of you are familiar with that phenomenon already. But in here, today I'm going to share a story that is called Wilhelmina Mending Her Heart. The way that we do these and the way that we've set up the podcast is in the one that I'm doing right now today. I'll simply relate the story, summarize it. It's told in greater detail in the book. But I'll get the story out there for you, and then I'll follow it up with a, a a podcast that we call Compassionate Response. These books have been in public for several years now, and so they've been available to people. When people hear of these stories, they sometimes will email me through my website with a broken heart because this story somehow connects to a story that's going on in their own life, the loss of a loved one of their own or something like that. Sometimes there's just intellectual curiosity, but I've found that most of the time when people take the time to, to uh, be in touch with me and express something about how a story moved them, it's often because it's touching something in their own uh, wounded heart. So compassion means to suffer with. And so a compassionate response to uh, questions that arise in viewers and listeners is the second in a three-part series. And then the last one we call spiritual practice. As a, uh, as a Catholic and a, a person of prayer, uh, I sometimes can coach people in a way to think or change a, 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 a way that they're doing things or introduce them to something new. So the third part we always call... Um, spiritual practice that arises from one of these stories. So just wanted to do that by way of review uh, and then go on to a story today. So I've said my prayers earlier, 
And when I do, I always pray to St. Michael the Archangel. Well, first of all, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's the Trinity. God known in our tradition as one in three, three persons in one uh, Godhead. And so that already includes uh, the person of Jesus, the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Creator. And inside of the mystery of their being, I think the rest of us are located inside of them. And we're, uh, I call out to Michael the Archangel, uh, St. Benedict, St. Uh, Dominic, my founder and father, uh, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Rose, a whole bunch of them who are friends of mine. And I've gotten to know a lot of these people that have shared their stories with me. <clears throat> so today, because I'm talking about Wilhelmina, I asked Wilhelmina, would you mind coming and sitting by me and being with me as we share your story yet again in another form on a podcast? I did. Does he? I think she died in the 1950s. Maybe I, I was born in 56, so maybe we overlapped a bit. She mentioned television once in passing, uh, but she was sitting in her front room listening to the radio. It sounded to me like a Southern woman. And uh, I remember uh, it's, a, it's a thing in the South to call your living room the front room. And the idea of listening to the radio, she was doing her mending. And she just didn't like doing it. In, in fact, she was uh, she she strongly disliked mending. But a couple of times a year, she would decide today's mending day. It just needs to be done. She'd proclaim it mending day. And then she told me that she would talk to the torn clothing to make a game out of it, to make the time pass and to have a little fun with it. So, But the problem was that uh, her beloved husband, they were retired and they'd been together a long time. Her beloved husband, Eric, walked into the room while she was doing her mending, dropped to the floor and died right in front of her. So she's a little different in that she did not die a sudden violent death. It's just that her husband died in front of her in a way that traumatized her. And she never really recovered from it. She, her, the way her grief moved, it never did reach any kind of healing. She moved outside of herself and said she's kind of stood next to herself for the rest of her life. I, I just call that dissociation. She, uh, she never really lived in her heart ever after because it was too painful. So that was the reason that in the afterlife she needed extra care. Uh, in the first of the two books in this series, I refer to that as being a stuck soul. And I think that she was mostly stuck. Uh, she, she moved at a very slow pace of healing in the afterlife because that's all that she would allow herself to do. So anyway, uh, uh, she told me the her story, so I'm going to just relate it to you the way that I received it in the dream and wrote it down. So this was uh, during the night of... Uh, September 21st, 2019. Here's that dream. I was alone in a room. I was sewing a button on a shirt or repairing a torn buttonhole. A man walked into the room, but didn't acknowledge me. He stared straight ahead with a pained expression. I shouted his name twice. Eric! And I awoke. So that turns out to be three sentences in my book. But I remember waking up from it and knowing that this was a contact dream. So I got together with a partner. We went into protected prayer and we met Wilhelmina. I was with my friend Zarina at her home when we uh, talked to... Wilhelmina. She said she uh, she really didn't like her name. She thought it was old timey, even when she was a, a, a child. And some of her siblings started calling her Willie. So Willie is what she went by for much of her life. But we stuck with uh, with Wilhelmina. Well, I've only already told you that she didn't die violently, but she she's just shut down. She said. uh he was dead weight. He hit the floor. And she said, you know how some people will, will say uh, he was dead when he hit the floor? Well, he was. She ran to the neighbors, got help. Uh, there just was nothing to be done. 
Before long, she said her house was filled with strangers, you know, uh, paramedics, neighbors she didn't even know that well. Somebody called her daughter. Uh, she said, my house just filled up with people. And all I wanted was for this day to start over again and not be this. You can appreciate that, can't you? Isn't there a part of your life that you might just like to rewind and change? Well, she was so overwhelmed and so grief stricken that she her her first reaction is what she continued with. She decided to move out of her heart and she began to say to herself, what should a woman do when her husband has just died suddenly? She probably ought to go to his closet and pick out the clothing he'll be laid out in. Wilhelmina told us that it was just too painful to live in her heart after what had just happened in front of her, her husband dropping dead on the floor. So in addition to thinking she, a woman who just went through that probably ought to go and get the clothes that will be laid out in. She probably ought to write an obituary. A woman who's just been through this probably should do. She just kept that pattern going. She she didn't live in her heart and in the center of her consciousness any longer. It was too painful. So she stepped aside and then she said, I became like an actress. I tried to anticipate what people expected of me and provide that. That sounds exhausting, doesn't it? Well, it exhausted her. After the funeral stuff was over, she just kept up with that same pattern. She was a Catholic, and she they used to go to Mass together. She would continue to go to Mass at her church, but she wouldn't stay for the social time because it was too exhausting. She said, people thought they were talking to me, but they were talking to the woman, the version of me that was right next to me, that was the actress. And so she would make excuses about the dog and the cat need her. She said that she... Uh, didn't want to run into anyone in the grocery store, so she bought only the most basic things like milk and eggs and bread. She said she stopped baking. Uh, nobody ever came to visit. Wilhelmina did a good job of describing basic dissociation, being unable because of trauma to live in your own first-person consciousness and and kind of going beside herself and living the rest of her life, I think like about nine years, she called herself an actress. She continued to do what she thought others expected her to do and try to provide that. So a woman whose husband has just died, she probably ought to, not I should, she probably ought to. Things really went worse for her. She said even her children and grandchildren, she didn't like having them around. She became the shell of a person. You get the picture. That's not a happy one at all. And she lived about another nine years. But she never really re-entered the fullness of her life because it was just too painful. So she's just a sweet person. If you choose to read the story in full, I think you'll just love her. But she indicated that eventually she was already, they were retired when Eric died, but eventually she did begin to have health issues uh, and, and not be able to live alone. Uh, she said she didn't mind that her children uh, put her in a nursing home. She didn't really want to live with either of them. And she thought that they were responsible children that took care of her financial affairs in her home and they visited and so on. So she had no beef about having been put in a home the way some people sometimes speak of that once she was in this nursing home it was two to a room and she didn't like people visiting so they they got the picture and she said they gave me only the sickest roommates the ones that were asleep most of the time or who had no visitors so really just a a, a really long sad decline story she was a believer and she believed in an afterlife and she uh, hoped that when she died, there would just be this kind of magical automatic reset 
and that things would be better and be happy because heaven is a happy place, that kind of thinking. Well, she told us that at, upon her death, she was alert and aware that she was in a new place, but she had grooved that habit of really not living her life and making free choices. And her guardian and the team of people who were assisting her in her afterlife said, there's nothing magic about life. You still have to live it. And you used to do a good job of it. You used to know exactly how to live your life freely and, and happily. We'll help you recover that. She said, I never had a stroke, but you know how people that have a stroke lose skills that then they have to do a bunch of therapy to gain back how to feed themselves, for example, or, you know, uh, talk therapies that, to regain the power of speech. She said, I never, never did that on the earth, but here it was a little like that. They were reminding me that I used to be able to live my life much more freely than I currently was and that they would help me. They also said, if you backslide, we will push you. Uh, but if you turn away from us completely, we won't be able to help you. She said, well, that just sounded wrong. It sounded like a sin. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to make life harder for people who are kind and who were only trying to help me. They said to me that you're giving us only a low level of energy with which to work, but we will receive it and work with it. So she thought that was fair and true. But after a while, I bothered her. She said, you know, when I was a girl in school, I wasn't the smartest or the fastest at anything. But she said it depended on the subject. Sometimes I could be if I put my mind to it. So it kind of began to annoy her that she knew she was moving more slowly than she probably could if she put forth some more effort. So she wasn't shamed or even um prodded too much but there were people telling her you know you're making progress at the pace that you're allowing yourself to progress if you ever choose to progress faster we'll be there to help even more well they began they they discovered that the, the health team that was was working with her in the afterlife discovered that she brightened and got energetic when talking about uh, childhood experiences when she was a girl in school. So they began to bring around for visits people that she had gone to school with decades before, little girlfriends from school. And some of them were people that she had known later in adulthood. They began to say things to her to kind of uh, inspire her to possibly come with them and do other things to kind of leave the room that she was in, if you will. They said, you know, you'd, you'd love to see this one or that one and see how they've changed, kind of like you might if you missed the reunion. Uh, she mentioned hopscotch. Do you know hopscotch, that game that you draw with chalk on a sidewalk? I think it's 10 boxes of different configurations and you throw a stone and you hop on one foot. I remember, you know, doing that as a child. Well, she remembered that and it brightened. It just somehow that touched a, a nerve in her. It just gave her joy to think of herself as a girl playing hopscotch. And they said, you know, you used to be a little more nimble and you can be again if you want to be because you don't have to be an old lady here. Uh, you could be the young girl that you used to be if you wanted to. She thought, well, that sounds interesting. And then they, they, her visitors would sometimes come two or three and say, as soon as we're finished visiting with you, we're going to go out to kind of a girl date for lunch. One of these days, maybe you'll come with us. So they'd kind of give her something to aspire to if she ever felt energetic enough to take them up on their offer. Well, the only reason that she came to me in a dream was that she was really ready to move. That's the way this, this ministry functions. I learned that 25 years ago. I I don't have to to coerce anybody or arm twist they go only get in my line when they're ready and so i said that to her or i guess my prayer partner did because i was helping her speak through uh that you you're it you're you must be pretty close to being ready to move 
or you wouldn't have shown up here at all. And she said, well, that's true. Well, anyway, one of her, I think it was one of her girlfriends, again, you can read it in Afterlife Interrupted book two. She, um, they said, well, if you're, if you're really ready to go out, uh, there's someone who would like to come with you. Well, of course, it was Eric, her husband, and, and his death was the reason that she was so locked up uh, inside anyway. But she had to be reminded. Now, remember, you've died, too, and you have access to him now. You don't have to grieve his absence, because if you allowed yourself, you could be with him and he could be with you. And she said, well, that makes sense. And she also felt a little bad about having made him wait even after she died. But uh, she agreed that she would be interested in... in uh, going out for a walk, and then her friend said, and you know he'd like to go with you. And they said he's been practicing. Well, it, it, you, again, you'll read it in greater detail if you choose to, but what he was practicing doing was presenting himself to her in the afterlife as his teenage version of himself as he looked on their first date. Isn't that sweet? Uh, and it is a, apparently a skill that we can learn in the afterlife how to present ourselves in in different ways and eric was had been practicing for kind of like a first date with his wife she thought that was very sweet and she agreed to it so when it came time for us to help her move along the image that appeared to her was uh eric as like a 16 year old and she said he's he's got a handful of roses that aren't the kind from the store that all match. They're ones that he picked from his mama's yard and they're all different colors and they're the homemade homegrown kind, but he's holding a, 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 a bouquet of roses. And she said, he just winked at me because he liked to do that. So that was all it took. She decided, okay, I've, I've uh, made it, him wait long enough. I'm capable of doing this. And so she moved from afterlife plane to plane, enticed by the opportunity to be back again with her lifelong love, Eric. So uh, we, we do, you know, ask people's permission to use their stories. We did talk to her one more time uh, about the whole process and this is just lovely. I, I, I hope you can appreciate it. Husband died and she kind of died inside uh, in that moment while she was mending clothes and talking to her torn clothing to try to make a game out of it. When she needed some help, she told us that in her own heart of hearts and her own prayer life, that sometimes she could pray to the creator sometimes to Jesus, but mo the most connected prayer that she ever felt was with Mother Mary. Well, she only had to say that once, and Mother Mary showed up with her, to her, just showed up and started talking to her. And she said it was just the plainest thing. It wasn't like she was there with crowns or angels uh, uh, holding the hem of her fancy garments or any such thing. She just showed up as a woman. Uh, she said, I knew who she was, but she just started talking to me like that was the most normal thing that could be. And Mary said to her, I, I need you to mend your heart. Naturally, it broke. And she, Mary said to Wilhelmina, did you know that I was a widow? And Wilhelmina said, well, I suppose that's true, but I never thought about it. And Mary said, well, my husband died before I did. That makes me a widow, right? And for a while, it hurt just like it hurt you. And for a while, I wasn't really able to do much. But she said, then I moved past that. And I want you to do the same. She said, of course, your heart is broken. It, sh it fell on the floor and shattered. And then there's this weird little detail. In Wilhelmina's sewing basket, she had a heart-shaped pin cushion. It was faded uh, cloth. Some batting was sticking out of it because it was torn on one side. Mary handed that to her and said, your heart is broken, but it's mendable. I just need you to mend it. And she handed her a needle and thread and said, here, would you take this? And Wilhelmina just said, she's not bossy, but she's really kind of forceful. <laughs> and so she, she did take the needle and thread and she 
sewed the torn part of this heart-shaped pin cushion that was a meme or a symbol of her own heart. And that was what helped her regather herself and be able to uh, begin to actually engage in her afterlife that eventually uh, involved reuniting with Eric, uh, her husband. So wonderful story. In the next couple of segments of the Joyful Friar podcast, the next time we'll go into a compassionate response to that story as I've shared it and as people have had questions about it. And then in the, the podcast after that, we'll go into a spiritual practice or two that might uh, kind of flow from this story that perhaps you or someone you love might find helpful. But for right now, uh, that's it for this episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm Father Nathan Castle, and if you would want to contact me, I prefer to be contacted through my website, which is nathan-castle.com. If you go on nathan-castle.com, there's a contact form. It will ask you a few basic things. One of them is uh, what time zone you live in, in case I want to try to reach you, if you would like that. Uh, sometimes I'll do a, a, a Zoom call or a phone call. Uh, anyway, it'll ask for just a few basic things. Please don't uh, ask me questions on Facebook Messenger. I just really don't like using that platform for that reason. Uh, and sometimes people will see this podcast in a video version on YouTube and where they can then go on it and uh, reply and ask questions. I'm much more prone to get back to you promptly if you simply email me through the website. All right. Well, God bless you. I, I hope uh, you've enjoyed this and I wish you blessings. Bye now. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Joyful Friar. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can make a donation by clicking the donate button. See you next time.